right. Good morning <clears throat> to you on Sunday. And it is <clears throat> August 21. Yeah. Right. August 21. <clears throat> We're going to get uh, into chapter 3 of 1 John. Hopefully we'll do chapter 3. Although we are probably got about oh, maybe 40 minutes here this morning. Um, this is really the heart of the book, where love and obedience come together, righteousness <clears throat> and grace come together, and uh, the children of God versus the children of the devil are contrasted. And this is really the message, the message that came from the beginning. It is now given to the church, which is love uh, manifested or demonstrated through obedience and faith and living by faith. This is really the heart of this book. Um, so I'm going to get uh, right to that. Uh, before we go on, let me just also mention again that uh, next week, the 28th, and uh, the following week, September 4th, we will not have class. Uh, next week we'll be... Uh, we won't, Kathy and I won't be here. We'll be at a baptism for uh, one of our, grand, our granddaughter. Week after that's Labor Day weekend, and we'll be out of town on that weekend. So this is our break in between the summer session and then the fall session. So we'll, after today, we'll be back in three weeks on September 11th. And we will go ahead and continue and finish um, the epistles of John at that time and then uh, decide whether we want to stay with John and go right into Revelation. <laughs> what do you think about that? Uh, we'll see. Or we can talk about that <laughs> if, if um, there's a desire to flip back to the Old Testament. Um, but I like what we're reading here in the light the epistles here in the light of what we had just studied for a year in the Gospel of John, understanding John's message uh, as an evangelist and as an apostle and uh, what his heart and mind was and what the purpose of, the, of writing the Gospel was and all of the dialogues that he recorded of Jesus teaching and his, especially the four chapters at the end, 14 to 17. Christ's last instructions to them at the Last Supper. All of that, all of what's in there is drawn out into um, the, for this first epistle of John. It draws out of that. So it's just, it, it's, I've gotten a lot more out of this epistle, reading it and studying it back to back with the gospel than I have ever before. And I, I hope that's what everybody else is getting to. So anyway, let's um, let's give thanks to the Lord. Father, thank you for the day that you've given to us, Lord. This is the day that you have made, and we are grateful, Father, to be together again, Lord, to be um, with you in your house. And that, Lord, you give us good things. You're faithful and you're merciful. Lord, you are just. You are holy. We can depend on you, Lord, from the beginning to the end. We thank you, Father, that you have called us, Lord, by name, each one. And that we have, we're here because we've heard your voice calling us, Lord, by name and drawing us into your kingdom. And we have done nothing, Father, um, to earn your favor or your grace. You've loved us when we were not lovable. And you drew us in, you bought us, and you redeemed us, with more by your uh, precious uh, blood, a price we could never even imagine, much less afford. So we're just thankful to you today. Be exalted. Let our hearts bring forth in gratitude for all that you are, Lord, and, and count ourselves today blessed of you, Lord, because we belong to you. We're your children. How awesome is that? Unimaginable. May we never forget, Lord, that, and we'll walk in that today, that Christ would be uh, manifest and exalted in all, that we would, Father, recede and become... Um, even as um, John the Baptist said, decreasing, that he would increase, Lord, decreasing in, in um, importance and in value because 
Oh, Lord, we uh, seek and want you to be known in all of the universe you've created, and you've given us that as our, um, our ability, Lord, to do and our calling to do, to make you known in this um, physical creation. So we're, we want to, we thank you that you sent the Son to do that very thing, to make the Father manifest and known to us. So, our Lord, we ask your blessing on our um, fellowship, on our time, and let you cause our hearts, Lord, to be still before you, that we'll hear nothing but your voice, and that you'll give by your Spirit, Lord, understanding to us a spirit of wisdom and understanding in the knowledge of Christ. So bless our fellowship today, and bless the outreach that's going to happen this afternoon after the service, that you would cause um, it to be, Father, successful in terms of just, Lord, proclaiming who you are and bringing folks in here, Father, into uh, this building and into the, into the parking lot who um, need to hear and see uh, Jesus. We just pray that you do a work in hearts and draw those, um, Lord, to, unto yourself and begin to do that work even today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <clears throat> All right. All right. So let me just, uh, I'm going to begin right by reading. I'm going to go back a couple of verses in chapter 2 because uh, the last couple of verses in 2 uh, actually are part of this first um paragraph in chapter 3. And now, dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. That is what we are. The reason that the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. What we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him, purifies himself just as he is pure. Let's stop right there for a moment. He's going to, um, from here, um, he's just uh, establishing and, and, and praising. It breaks out of this just exclamation of praise to God. Oh, how un unimaginably and unfathomably awesome it is to be that the fact that we are even sons of the living God we're called his children we're not just pardoned criminals we're not just forgiven sinners because we all deserve the death sentence and we all come in to the family of God into Christ by passing from death into life Jew or Gentile, lost and apart from God because of sin and needing the blood sacrifice between the holy God who sits enthroned between the cherubim and the outer court of the temple and in between the two, blood splattered and poured all over an altar between sinful man and holy God. And now that's done. It's done. It's finished in the sun, and the veil in the temple is torn open, and now access to all who come through the, the blood of the sun. The status, our status, we didn't even think of that when we first came and we first believed in Christ. We weren't thinking that. I, I'm, not, I'm now going to be coming in and entering as a son in direct relationship with the Father. We're just thinking of, I'm desperate, I'm dead, I need to be alive. If you're there, show yourself to me. Yeah. I'm done with this. I need to kind. I need that. You're not even thinking about the fact that you're you're now coming in from being somebody who's who's 
outside of the family and who, who is lost without a father, without a relationship with God, which all men are. In the first Adam, all men are without a relationship with God and they're therefore dead to God. And then they go from being dead in sin and dead towards God to being alive and dead to sin and alive to God. And now with the status of being called a child of the Father. And now God is called Father. A, a, a concept, an idea that, that the Jew would never, he wouldn't even allow the thought of calling God Father. They didn't call him Father. The first thing that, remember the first thing that Jesus spoke when they asked him, Lord, teach us to pray? Our Father, which art in heaven. And it was, that, was, that was groundbreaking for Christ and the, to teach his disciples. To call and refer to God, the first thing out of your mouth, Father. And when he prays in John 17, Holy Father, I'm coming to you. These that you have given to me are mine. Are, they're yours. You have given them to me and I've given them back to you and they're yours. They are yours, and, but you have given them to me to take, to take care of and to disciple Father, keep them in your love. Cause them to abide in you. Sanctify them from this world that's out here where, the, where they're in this enemy territory and the, and the devil and his darkness. Keep them sanctified and set apart by thy truth. Your word is truth. He intercedes for them as sons, as fellow heirs. Not just as, not just as a flock that needs to be tended, but as sons. So John is, you know, we just, in the last chapter, chapter 2, when we talked about love, not the world, and, and there, there was the talk about the Father and the Son. It, um, if you remain in the Son, you'll, you'll remain in the Father, and this is what the, he's promised us, eternal life, and eternal life is in the Son. This is eternal life. But then we get to back into chapter 5. Eternal life is this, to know him, the only true God, and the Son, whom he has sent, that's eternal life. The knowledge of an experiential knowledge of coming into relationship with God through the Son, which is the only way to come to Him, is eternal life. Doesn't get you eternal life. It is eternal life. It is the pet because He is eternal life. And that's exactly what Jesus said in John 17. It's exactly what John is teaching in this letter that Jesus is eternal life, and to know him um, is eternal life. And if you know him, then things are going to be different in your life, that people are going to see your life on the outside, because something drastically, radically has happened on the inside that completely transforms you on the inside. That's, and that is, first and foremost, you come into relationship with the Father, through the Son, and so there's a new life that has happened there. Um, as Paul has said, any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, all things are become new. Why? Because there's a new life that's begun there. And uh, the, the only, I'm, I'm, and if I can't tell that on the outside, I don't have any grounds to believe that, um, that a new life has begun. That doesn't mean I don't know that, but here, here's what, what, what John is teaching us, that um, I don't know whether some, if, if somebody makes a profession to, to, to say I'm a Christian or, or this or, uh, or, I, um, or I believe in God, um, well, the devil believes in God too. He, he's got very good theology about God. He used to, he used to work in his presence as a, a worship leader, but, and he, he does, he's not an atheist, but he'll, he'll, he'll try to convince us to be atheists or live like it, but he, he knows there's a God, but, but he's not a Christian. He's not a follower. He's not a disciple. And he's not a son. So, um, what, what John is saying here, if the life doesn't back up the profession, we don't have any grounds to know. I just don't know whether you're a Christian or not. So I have to assume you're not unless I see the fruit of it. A life that's been transformed on the inside is going to is going to translate into a life that that's completely different on the outside. 
Monday through Saturday, not just on Sunday, because we have to attend. We know where other believers are. But 100% of the time, because of, because it's a relationship that, that is being lived out of you. And that, that's, the, that's the relationship between, between loving God and, uh, and uh, doing the works that, that demonstrate that God is alive in you. And that's you know that's one of, that's one of the main the main purposes of coming together is to to stir up the what Paul says love and good works the kind of behavior and the kind of that lifestyle that's different than the what what you what you were when you were walking in the world there's going to be a lifestyle change because there that's death and that those are people who are living as though they're dead to God but you're not. Um, so first of all, is, is to be completely blown away by the, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, the great love that the Father has lavished on us completely blows me away, that, that he would even call me son. I'm his child. That means with that, that, with that you see, and that, and that's why the, to, to the Jew it would almost be blasphemous, because that means that everything that the Father is, I am by, um, not just by creation, but by um, the fact that my life proceeded out of his life. And just like DNA is transmitted, you know, th through biological reproduction, so that the child takes on all of the, the same physical attributes as the parent, we have the attributes that are... Uh, like God, His image and likeness has to do with more than just our physical appearance. Two arms, two legs, two eyes, two ears. We can hear, we can see. And, he, and God does all that stuff. But it has to do with intellect, emotions, and will. It has to do with heart. It has to do the way with the need for intimacy, relationship with God first and then others. He created you for that. And guess what? You can have that without having a body at all. You can have a relationship with, after all, God doesn't have a body. We well, didn't until Jesus was born. For eternity, he existed without physical creation. He was nonetheless one of real. And, and what he wants of us is, is a relationship with us. He created us for that. He didn't create any other animal or any other being for that. He created us in his, in his image and likeness. Then that's lost in Adam because of the fall. But it was love that put Jesus on the cross. And that's not just a nice warm sentiment on a Hallmark card. It was love that put that made Christ go into Gethsemane and then past Gethsemane to allow himself to be arrested. God so loved the world the broken, fallen, sinful world that he gave his only begotten son, meaning he gave his life and poured it out so that whoever would look and believe in him, same way as the Israelites looked up at that bronze serpent in the desert, if you look, that's what Jesus compared it to in John chapter 3. That was an act of faith by looking up to what God had sent us for our healing, that you would not perish in this wilderness, on this messed up, broken darkness of, of this world, but you would have eternal life. Not when just when I die, but here. That's when Jesus came. You look to the Son, you have life. How great is the love that the Father had. That's a, I need to have that verse in my life every morning when I wake up. I am blown away by how much you love me, God. Because if I don't start with that, I'm going to be I'm going to be blown away by the by the tasks on my agenda for the day. I got to do this. I got to do that. Do the other day. The day comes to, to, to an end, and I've done half of it. Then I feel like a failure. Well, Lord, and I forgive me for not you know forgive me for doing this. Forgive me for not doing that. Forgive me for doing that wrong. You know, and. Um, but if I start off with the fact that I'm in relationship with him because he loves me in a way I could never comprehend or understand, but yet I have it and I experience it and I'm abiding in that. 
everything else will flow out of that. And that's what that's that's what it is. Abide in love. Would you say that when Jesus referred to the Father, uh, the God as His Father, was that it's kind of like the beginning of the conspiracy of them to kill Him, because they considered it blasphemy, and it's kind of like at least yeah. That's when they decided they were going to kill him. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right because yeah. with that also came his uh, his absolute outright claims to to deity. You know, uh, mm -hmm. he equated himself as, as equal. Like, as like in equal. chapter chapter mm -hmm. eight particularly, which is a real long confrontation between the Pharisees and and Christ, and then it culminates with before Abraham was born, I am. Yeah. Boom. They dropped everything. Their faces got beat red. Their eyes were popping out, and they picked up stones to stone him. We don't need to hear one more thing. And they began to stone him to, to death. But he slipped through the cloud. The crowd miraculously disappeared. That was it. But yeah, um, the fact that you know, uh, and then and then that next chapter after after the uh, healing of the blind man, chapter ten, I and the Father are one. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So he's, yes, he's equating himself. By doing that, he's, he's making himself equal to God. No questions. No, absolutely no, no question about that. He's making himself equal to God. So what does that say about us as believers? Um, to the world who doesn't know God, a lot of people will think that, I mean, even, even my, um, you know, uh, as a new Christian in my 20s, my Catholic family background, they would look at that they we're more we're more arrogant or proud than, than them because well why 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 do you talk why do you say that well because you 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 think for you know for certain you're going to heaven but we're not sure we're not sure whether we're going to go to heaven or not so they look at that as like you're you're more proud than, than them because you have this absolute assurance well well. Well, it's not because I think I'm better or have any uh, resume of good works behind me. It's because I know him right now. And that's not going to stop. It can't stop once I know him. Now, um, I, I think you know, if somebody falls away and they, and they, after much uh, moving of the Holy Spirit to bring them to repentance and they, they refuse and refuse and refuse, I think God will take somebody home early and they'll lose a lot of blessing and reward. Um, that's a different subject. Mm -hmm. But when you come into relationship with Christ as a son, that doesn't change. You can't un be, be unborn again, fall away, and then get born again a second time, fall away, now I'll come back, get born again a third time. You don't get born again, again, and again, and again. You get born again, and you're changed. A new life, a new creation has begun. And he comes in and he seals you. The Holy Spirit abides there, remains there to the day of redemption. Now you, now you can perish early, but if you fall away and, and, um, and you're not coming back, I think most people, most of the time that doesn't happen. Most of the time somebody knows the Lord, they're a hundred times more miserable trying to live in the world than they are as, a, as an unregenerate person because they know what they're doing and they're, they, it's much harder to sleep at night to deal with that. And I've, heard, I've heard that from a number of people who have backslid. Yeah, but I never, what you said about you know, your Catholic relatives, and I never heard that before from, from anyone. And that's so bizarre to me because, A, number one, the work of Christ then is not sufficient. And number two, if you can't know, that depends on you then to do good works, right? That's exactly. It, it is a work it's like system. The old covenant. It's very. Covenant. It is much the old covenant. It's just like Islam, really. Yes. Yes. There's the, ba like the balance. There's yeah. a, ba a, mm -hmm. a scale of balance, mm -hmm. and you hope that the good outweighs the bad. Yeah, I used to think that before I got saved. Yeah, I was a little bit better than I was. That's our religious upbringing cool. that was there, and mm -hmm. it, and it's based on the fact that you don't know, you don't have a personal relationship with the Lord. Yeah. That shows you how far that the so-called visible church has has gone. It's. When the visible church that that looks and everybody says, oh, you know, so and so, Catholic church or so and so Methodist or Lutheran church or whatever it is, and it, and they and they have lost what it means to be born again, and the that's, and that's the gospel, and the gospel isn't isn't primary and it's central in, in the New Testament. Then 
what we really have is not, not we don't have the church anymore that's just maybe off on a side tangent or a doctrine like, uh, here's a church over here that that's all they want to talk about is the gifts of the Spirit. Here's one over here that's all they want to talk about is the end times and they're on, they're on uh, out of balance here. It's not the church. It's, it's apostate. It's not the church at all because they, they, people coming in there, they don't know the Lord and they're just hearing things about the Lord. It's the historic Jesus. But it's not one who's alive right now that, that you're supposed to put faith in and, and he's alive and he will come into your life and you'll have a relationship with him as a son, as a daughter, by faith. That, that's what, that's, you can't read the New Testament honestly and ask God to speak to you through it and not come out finding and being challenged. I either know him or I don't know him. This is it's not it's not religion. In fact, it was birthed by in its at the very the, the the very event of Jesus stepping on the earth for those three years, two thousand years ago. It turned religion over upside down on its head and it blew it away. And that's why the Jews could have nothing to do with him. They would would either have to repent and get turn and and uh, disband the Pharisees because it's no longer by works. It never was. Never, God never intended that. But they were so steeped in in their self righteousness because of what they were doing and all the list of religious and they added the robes and they added all this other stuff and then the you know the teachings of the rabbis and the Talmud and all the other stuff that. It's like, um, kind of like what Ravi said. He says, we have, we have 17,000 <clears throat> pages in our law books because we can't follow 10 words on a tablet of stone. <laughs> and that's what the, the Jewish rabbis have done. They've got all of the writings of the rabbis to add on to God's law about what's, what's work and what's not work on a Sabbath day, what they can and can't do. And they've lost the, simp the simplicity that God wanted a relationship with them. And that's unfortunate. So, the, so that's, um, anyway, um, that's, that's where we're at these days. But, um, but God always has a remnant. And uh, it's not easy, but we're called to do, um, and it's, the cha it's a challenge of every church, whether it's denominational or non-denominational like, like ours, to stay focused on the simplicity of Christ, the centrality of Christ and the cross, and not add to it or not take away from it. And don't let anything um, become the main thing that is, that is aside from that. Jesus first. And he's proud, and that, um, and it all begins with being born again. Unless you're born again, you shall not see the kingdom of heaven. I need, and that's where my life started when I was born again. I didn't change religions. My Catholic family thought so. They thought I just stopped being Catholic and I decided to try something different. They didn't understand that. <clears throat> I tried to make it sure that whatever was um, I was talking about was about Jesus and about who he was and about what he had done in my life. And that became the witness because it had, I wasn't talking about Oh, they'd ask about the fisherman's net and, and what, what kind of a place it's like and what it's like and stuff like that. But it's not the people that changed my life. If there was, if there was any value or merit there, it was that Jesus changed their life. And I saw that and, I, and it challenged me because my life was as black and, and dark and dirty as, as Frank's was before. I just didn't do the same things he did. But I was filled with the same hate in anger and lust and all the other stuff because, and, and I was miserable. One thing that they did say, have to say and admit was that you're not the same person, and I'll tell you that. My brothers who were all into the full party scene and smoking weed and doing all that stuff, and then my dad who didn't go to church anymore but still was raised in it from childhood because they came from Italy after all, where the Roman church is centered and they, his aunts were nuns in the Vatican and they're, I mean, they're steeped, they're steeped into this tradition. So 
So there. So even though he didn't go anymore, the fact that his kids weren't going anymore was still. <laughs> you, you're apostate. You've left the faith. You know? So, um, but they had to admit that you changed. You're different. You're a different person. It's not. And then they went from from. Um, um, you've left our religion to. Um, now you're now you're uh, a fanatic. <laughs> a, a, religious, yeah. a religious fanatic. Because God is on your thoughts on every part of your life. And all and, and I'm like, how can that not be? How can that not be if he's real and he's alive? How can it just be something that I think about one hour a week? We're alive, and that's the way God meant it to be, our life with him. Adam walked and talked with God until chapter 3, Genesis. And then he got that back some, somehow again. God, remember, God pursued him. And when God pursued him, and he began to talk to Adam, and Adam responded and answered. The blood was shed, garments were made to cover him in his nakedness, and life went on. And a promise was given of blood that would be shed for all sins. And that's what we have in Christ. All because of love. That's what John understood. The gospel is born out of the love of God. And the fact that I have a relationship with him as a son, that is evidence of the love of God. This comes right out of, now Paul would say it this way in chapter 5, verse 8. The love of God is manifested in, in the physical creation in the, is demonstrated manifestly in this that Christ while we were yet sinners Christ died for us not when we deserved it and he thought alright they're, they're making a few steps towards me I'll make a few steps towards them now while we were in our rebellion and our sin God manifestly demonstrated his love towards us that while we were yet sinners Christ died for the ungodly Romans 5, 6 through 8. That's what John is saying here. That love of God. And that is, that is what we are. The world does not know us. The reason it doesn't know us is that it does not know Jesus. It doesn't know him. No, it might have known, it might have heard about the carpenter from Nazareth that was an itinerant preacher and wandering around and, and uh, uh, getting all the Jews angry at every synagogue he went to and starting wars, and the religious wars and and, uh, but making, but may, uh, but also creating crowds of tens of thousands who are being fed and were being healed, you know, and we're seeing with their own eyes that this man was more than just an itinerant preacher. He was more than that. He did not speak like any other man. He spoke with authority. He spoke as if he knew God, and he did come from God's <coughs> very presence. And even more than that, if you listen very carefully. He spoke as if he was God, and he made that clear. The reason why the world doesn't know who we are is because it doesn't know him. Now, if you remember in John chapters 14 to 16, he said the same thing to his disciples. What they said, they didn't like the master, they ain't going to like the servant. What they did to the shepherd, they're going to do to the sheep too. But don't be discouraged. I have overcome the world. In the world, you're going to have this kind of trouble. You're going to be persecuted. Some of you are going to die. But be, don't be discouraged. I have overcome the world. This is what John, every, remember I said everything that, everything that John recorded about what Jesus taught and did in the gospel, he's writing now to us as, as, as disciples to live this out here. The, the world doesn't know you because it doesn't know him. And they're not going to understand um, who and what you are and what you have as a child of God. Because they don't know him. You need to get over the fact that the worldly person at, at your job just insulted you. I'm like, how in the world could they say that? Get away? I'm offended because of that. Well, what do you want? How, how what, you know, what, we need to just stop expecting Christian behavior and godly thinking from somebody who is not capable of it. They're not capable of love. And so John is about to tell us that we get to chapter 4. He does not love, doesn't know God because God is love. They're not capable of 
of acting and behaving in a way that that demonstrates love they're not capable of because love doesn't live inside them and that's why it's just an opportunity for you and me to love the one who's not loving and who's not deserving of it and who doesn't love it in return that is the best witness like Paul said it heaps burning coals on them on their head because they know that they're not acting that way and how can you treat me so kindly when I've when I've just bashed you behind your back. I had a, I, I sat in a barber's chair once about 25 years ago. I had a, dog, a barber that I liked. And he was living in a swinging lifestyle with multiple partners coming to the thumb and And he just defended that to me. And he knew I was a born-again Christian and served the Lord. And one of his grown daughters was a born-again Christian. And he couldn't have anything to do with her because she would tell him what he was doing was wrong. So he was all ready to argue with me. He thought I was going to sit there and argue with him and tell him he was wrong. <laughs> but I was just kind and, and you know, um, appreciative of the work that he did. And I always had compliments for him and stuff like that. And, and his partner, the guy in the next chair, one time he said, uh, when uh, Dave was in the back room, for some, I don't know why you're so nice to him, because before you came in here, he just bad-mouthed you to no end. And I, I just smiled. I think, God is, God, did some, God is doing something, and he's using me here. And <laughs> it bothered him that I was nice to him. You know? and, and that's what love does. Mm -hmm. You know, because I wasn't going to argue with his uh, his wrong uh, his wrong use of of Matthew seven one. Now, now, Greg, don't don't judge. Judge not, lest you be judged. <laughs> <laughs> but, I was wondering why you weren't going to repay evil for evil, <laughs> <laughs> or an insult for an insult. Yeah, yeah. So, so I thought that was cool. So the reason the world doesn't know us is that why we could spend a half, an hour on two verses and never get the rest of <laughs> dear friend. Now we are children of God, and what we, we, we what we are what we will be what will be manifest when we're its children is not um, has not yet been made known, but we know that when He appears in the sky and every eye will see Him in His glory, same way as. As John would say, <clears throat> when together with uh, his brother James and Peter on the mount in, John, in Matthew 17, and they saw him appearing in absolute splendor and radiant light and the glory of God about, imagine the eyes with flaming fire and everything the way that John saw him in, in Revelation, the opening chapter of Revelation. And they're seeing him like this. He's coming, this ain't the carpenter from Nazareth. Here they're seeing the Son of God. And when we, every eye will see him, imagine the unbelieving eyes too. And the darkness that's inside is bestowing. And all this time you justified your sin because everyone else was doing it. And it was the only way that, how could, how could God expect me to do everything different when that's the way of the society around me? Never stopping to look and think that there's something bigger than the society around me and what the majority thinks and what the majority lives. And that's more important to me because he's the one I'm going to stand before and answer to. And after all, I don't get my life and derive my life from the majority of the society around me. And why should I want to? Because the society around me that tries to squeeze me into its mold has shown me again and again and again that it doesn't love me. It will use me and take what I can give it and then leave me empty and, and leave me for dead. But it doesn't love me and it doesn't have its desire to want to make me something that I can never be. That's the world I live in. Why do I keep trying to make the world my goal of what I want to become like and walk into? Instead of Jesus, when I see him face to face, I'm going to look and see him and all that I am and was intended to be is in Christ, and I'm going to want that. And that's what he says. Listen to this. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we'll see him as he is. And everyone who has this expectation, that's what hope, the hope of expectation. When you expect you're going to see him 
evidently, eventually on that day, you will purify yourself just as he is pure right now, 100%. I'm going to purify myself that way. Amen. Amen. Then we, it goes on from there, and it, and it dichotomizes between the lawless and the one who is a believer. The one who is a child and a son no longer commits sin. It, he, why? Because in him is the seed of life, which is Christ, the Word of God made flesh. And he can't sin because the one that lives in you can't sin. And when you're abiding in him, you will not be able to sin on purpose as a practice. The one who sins as a practice and does it unintentionally as a lifestyle, John says, does not and cannot know him and can't be a child of God. He's dichotomizing. Hereby we know the children of God from the children of the devil. The practice which is born out of a love for God. So, the reason why I love this coming down to verse 8. Um, we'll have to end up right there with verse 8. But every time I read verse 8, I can't not but think of George Bogle. It's whenever he was praying from 12 a.m. to 2 in the morning. Most of his prayers against the, that for deliverance from somebody ended up with this verse. For this reason, the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Um, but there's a first part to that verse, too. He who does what is sinful is of the devil. Now he's talking about, and we'll, we'll have to take this up in another class, about um, this idea of, uh, can, it, it, it can, what, is John talking about sinless perfection? Does that mean you'll never sin anymore? In chapter 1 and other places it says, if you think, if you say you haven't sinned, you're a liar and the truth isn't in you. That, that, there, um, that you have to acknowledge and confess the sins that you do. So, uh, and there's a little confusion there. If you take your doc, if you try to make a doctrine or a theology out of just one or two verses without getting the whole book, you're going to have a problem because he says clearly that there's no one who doesn't sin, but then it, what he's talking about in this chapter is about sinning as a lifestyle. You don't continue in sin on purpose and, uh, and know the God. The one who is living sinfully as a lifestyle is of the devil because the devil just exactly does that and he's been doing that from the beginning. The reason why the Son of God came into this world, he, he, he was manifested, he, he manifested to all humanity the perfect and holy God was that he would destroy the works of the devil. What are the works of the devil? The works of the devil don't just have to do with nations and, and judgment, and it doesn't just have to do with like sexual immorality like Sodom and Gomorrah and God destroying the, the, the or even the idolatry in, that caused Israel to be, and Judah to be taken captive into Babylon. The works of the devil are what's on the inside of man. The brokenness, the fact that man has now got darkness on the inside and he's a slave to sin. The devil comes but John chapter 10, but to steal, to kill, to rob, to destroy, what? Nations, authorities and nations? No, people. To kill, steal, and destroy me and your parents and your kids and all of us from Adam on down. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil who was a destroyer of what God's work was in creating man in his image and likeness. And he destroyed the devil's hole by stripping him of the dominion and the authority he had over man so that man is no longer a slave to sin and no longer is bound to do the devil's will every time the devil snaps his finger and pushes a certain button. We are set free from that. That's what Christ, Christ came to destroy and undo that work of the devil. So um, the rest of this chapter was going to be the dichotomizing between the children of the devil and the children of the, 
of child of God. The acts and the works of the right of the child of God is righteous compared to those that aren't. There's a, a whole list of the dichotomies that we're going to see in chapters three and four, and uh, the, and the centrality of love and being children of God. Well, I hate it when we're out of time. This just seems like we just get warmed up. But, uh, God is good. We got a uh, blessed day um, to look forward to today. And uh, we will see you back in uh, three weeks for our class again. And we'll take up and finish this great book. Which you might want to do, and I would encourage you to do, it's a short, you know, five short chapters. Read the book as a whole. Read the book as a whole, you know, at least, at least, at least once each week um, to get all, to, to, it'll help, it'll help put all the parts in a, in a better perspective if you read the letter as a whole. All right, folks, let's pray. Who wants to, any volunteers who would like to close this prayer? Go ahead. Gracious, eternal, and almighty Father, we thank you for the study in the book of John, of the love that you have lavished upon us, Lord. And, and we just pray that today, Lord, that we would have opportunities to speak the words of life and love to our neighbors around us. Father, I pray that you would give us a window of opportunity with no rain. And I pray also, Lord, that you would be in our midst this morning as we enter your courts with praise and thanksgiving. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen.